I'm going to recommend that that when uh, we move to approve bids and contracts that we um, that we pull PC 66 and I'm going to recommend um, that we do not approve PC 66 which is reading support program for students with disabilities it's to grant um, $60,000 to a company called Really Great Reading Company, LLC. And um, I did do my homework and look on, looked at it online and um, read through whatever I could find. I also read um, what they called their research white paper. And um, I do want to say that I have some experience in this area and I've done some of my own research and I never did that before but I just want everyone to know that this is an area that I, I know quite a bit about and let me give you the reasons why and I think all my colleagues have it in writing but I want the public to hear it. Um, First of all, there's no research evidence included in this white paper that specifically um, provides evidence that this program um, improves reading overall, improves reading ability overall, or improves comprehension. Um, and I do not consider it an evidence-based program. There's a lot of research in here on various things, but it's not on the program itself. So we have no idea if that results in any, any real improvement in reading. Um, two, there's no evidence presented in the bids and contract support report that students who use this program in the six pilot schools have demonstrated progress in their overall reading ability. I do know that, you know, Student, the teachers like it, and there's probably anecdotal evidence to that of improvement, but I don't see any hard data. Um, three, um, and this is coming from my own knowledge base, students with reading disabilities, because this is supposed to be for reading, students with reading disabilities. Mm -hmm. And we do know that um, they have a variety of needs, not necessarily supported by this program. The scope of this program is very narrow, providing only isolated decoding skills without thorough evidence that decoding in isolation is the source of a reading disability. This program can actually do more harm than good. <coughs> in other words, one size does not fit all reading disabilities. My own and many other research studies indicate that isolated decoding, which is what this um, program um, provides does not necessarily transfer to actual text reading or to comprehension. Four, there are no credentials presented in the bids and contract report nor in the company's own website for the trainers of this program, which costs $3,250 per training. Trainers could be salespeople hired by the company to, to conduct trainings. They could also have a lot of credentials. But there's nothing offered. We don't know. Um, and, but I do know that we can offer an entire university graduate or PD course on disabilities taught by PhDs in, and reading specialists for this fee or less for a whole course, not one training. Um, and the last one I want to mention is that the use of grant funding for summer and school year training for a non-research-based commercial reading program um, offered by questionably qualified trainers is not appropriate. Alternatively, professional development should provide basic knowledge for teachers on how to conduct thorough evaluations of reading disabilities that lead to differentiated, targeted instruction. Um, so I. I imagine the, the crew is here and the, the, the committee, and I, I don't want to in any way denigrate this committee. Um, I thank you for your service. I just have major concerns about this particular commercial program. May I, Chair, may I make a comment? Yes, ma'am. I went back and looked at a year ago 
when we were yet again having a discussion about technology and the use of software and how this is going to be done within the system. And Dr. Altwerger had asked for the development of a comprehensive plan and vision and create guidelines for the use of technology and software in, in educating our students and for instructional purposes. And I have to say, $50 million deficit or not, I am uncomfortable as one of these board members continuing to approve for spending money on program on software and programs where we don't know if they're working or they're not working. I mean, I, anecdotal is okay, but I, but data is better. And I know you two are trying to strive for this, but I'm getting to the point where I would like us to say, okay, let's let's get this done so that we keep we don't keep spending this money not knowing whether or not it's really going to benefit and if it's even in the direction we want to go as a school system. I can speak to this, but I don't, I'm, I'm struggling for what the question is, but I'm, I'm going to speak to it generally. We have been working on a comprehensive literacy plan. We actually submitted one to the state and a large piece of what we feel is really have historically lacking is an intervention program that's consistent and that's used between all levels and that's used for all students. And not that every student has the same needs at all. And so part of it's actually identifying which child would be appropriate for an intervention. Really great reading is a very targeted decoding intervention. So it's for a limited number of students because a very limited number of students would benefit from that sort of decoding intervention. So that's for students who really did not learn how to read an initial instruction in terms of phonemic awareness or in terms of sound syllable or morphine awareness, those sort of general prerequisites for reading for most people. This is not something that we would generally do with every student because not every student would benefit from that experience. We've reviewed lots of different vendors who provide this service. Um, one of the things we do know in, in language and literacy, and I know Dr. Waltwerger, you know this, but for everyone else's benefit, is that we actually generally have a very good sense of how to teach phonics and phonemic awareness. It is one of the only things that I can say pretty, pretty clearly, we actually know how to teach right. that. Exactly. It's interesting that this is a newer product, and so it looks a little bit shinier, it has a better appeal for children, but because it has a knowledge of a research basis, we feel confident with it, because there aren't very many products that are newer and yet actually meet these prerequisite skills. And so we did, we looked at all of the validated projects and we do think that this is promising because of the fact that it has the literature base behind it. So all of the practices that are in it are evidence-based rather than it having been validated through research at this point. At some point, we are going to have to validate ourselves, like you said. So if we use it in our schools, so these six pilot schools, and if we use it in a few more schools next year, then we would have to validate its usefulness and effectiveness with our students to make decisions if we would continue to support it. So completely this would be something that we would consider a promising practice because it's evidence-based rather than already validated. But all of the components that are in there are things that are researched and supported. The, the program itself has not been research-based. It, 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 they provide a lot of general information about research in general things that we know about learning to read. I'm concerned that this is going to 42 elementary schools and 10 middle schools. Even the most dedicated proponent of decoding as an avenue toward proficient reading admits that, at, that it is most effective at the younger ages, not middle school. Even the N NRP report, which I, is highly criticized, yeah. cautions us about that, about going back to isolated decoding at the upper elementary or middle school level. Um, I, I really don't feel comfortable taking grant money, precious grant money, and using it for training Seriously, these commercial programs send out their best, you know, hawkers to do the training. I don't trust the training. I don't want, and I'm worried that our teachers will think that because they have this, they need to use it for children. You know, 
there is, as you say, Carolyn, a, a percentage of kids who need targeted decoding skills. That, it, in my opinion, training, doing summer school training and school year training with a, by a commercial <coughs> program um, trainer is very concerning. Let's take the $60,000, contact one of the many wonderful universities we have here, and provide a course or a training series from a faculty member who has a PhD in, in reading, in reading processes, neurobiological processes, and really give our, our teachers the basic knowledge rather than a training course on how to use a commercial program. That's what I, my preference would be, is to use our money to educate our teachers, not train them. It's a difference. I, I think that it's really important to provide professional learning, and we can certainly look at a different methodology than using a vendor to provide professional learning in this case. We do actually need the materials as well, though, so it is for a targeted number of students. It's definitely not something that you would do school-wide, especially not at middle school. It's not something that is for every child, and it's not the very first methodology would necessarily use either. May I make a suggestion sure. that for the people, for the teachers who have used this and who think it's worthwhile, and for the students who have used it, continue. Provide, you know, use it at a very, you know, the 16,000, rather than all of a sudden spreading it to 42 schools. You know, and let's collect some data and see if we think that this is worthwhile. But my understanding is we have been using this. So I guess we the have. question is, so where I'm is saying, the data? So we, so we do us. have some initial data. Do you think maybe it would be reasonable instead of having this discussion as part of bids and contracts that maybe Dr. Altberger could meet with this, with our crew who has all assembled here to go over all of this um, to become satisfied and then bring that um, level of her level of expertise back to the hive on I'd this. I'd be glad to. I, and totally, I actually I'd, meant to. I would do normally that. totally support your suggestion, but I feel as if there has been a lot of time given to be very negative and almost slandering a, a commercial organization that could sue us. And so I think that it's important that we hear positive to provide balance because we have very highly qualified staff and they could explain the rationale for this. I'm gonna, I, I asked Ms. Or, Agnes to join us to just share some positive information about the trial so far. Hi, I'm Joyce Agnes, I'm Instructional Facilitator, Department of Special Ed for Instructional Interventions. I'm a new team that we've put together to really look at instruction for our students with disabilities. Um, but we partner very closely with the curriculum office um, as we work through. Um, we do have preliminary data for really great reading. Um, it's, we've looked at numerous tools. Um, and as Caroline said, we're looking at tools that provide also the materials that our teachers need to teach it. Um, so this was one that we looked at when we went out that we were very excited about. Um, so the preliminary data, data is for the first two quarters. Um, so we piloted in four elementary schools and two middle. This, this is the elementary data. Um, we're not only using the really great reading data, we're also using that they that you get when you enter the scores in for the kids take on the, the assessment that goes with it. But we also use um, a fluency check that is not part of the program, and we're using the benchmarks to look at comprehension because if, as you've said, you need to make that connection. So what we're looking at is, is it increasing their fluency and is it increasing their comprehension, which is critical. Um, especially for our kids that are way really far behind in middle and, and in the upper grades. So what we looked at is for the 52 students that I had two quarters of data because kids kind of go in, come in late, so you can't, it's not that solid. Um, we will have four quarters by the end of this year and we will have actually more data with two more quarters for folks that started in January. 
Um, so under the benchmark assessment, we out of the 52 kids, we have 12% that didn't show a change in their comprehension. We have 30%, 37% that moved up one total benchmark level, um, which remember this is two only two quarters of data, not even a solid two. And then we had 46% of the students that moved up two or more benchmark levels um, in those two quarters. When we look at their fluency, we had 15% that showed no markable change, 21% showed an increase of 10%, 19% showed an increase of 20%, 8% showed an increase of 30%, and 25% of the kids had a 30% or more growth in their um, oral fluency, which is what decoding is, is really about in terms of getting the oral fluency, which then impacts the comprehension well, as, you, as you move forward. <laughs> Um, so that's the preliminary data that we have um, up to this Thank point, you. and we're, we're using three different data points because we didn't want to just stick to one measure um, that's a program. Can I ask you, did you compare those kids to um, a, a, another, a, a comparable sample of kids to see if they moved up more than other children would? That's, our, that's the piece that we're looking at at the end of the year is we want to do is compare it to kids that are in, say, foundations right? Um, well, to see, because that's a comparable program that we have. Um, it's not as multi-sensory. It's not, I mean, nothing is apples to apples. Um, right. So it, we, we, but it's what we have. So we want to look at foundations across the same school settings. So we're, we're trying to get as like kids as we can population-wise. Um, and compare the two programs to see where we're going to go. But I, I won't be able to do that until I'm at the end. Um, okay. And I have the um, four quarters of my fourth quarter. Okay. Thank as you. As we go through. Ms. Delmont Small. I'm, I'm still agreeing with my colleague. I think we should, I would appreciate pulling this out of the bundle. Well, we can pull it out until we get better data. Right, exactly. And then consider it again when we know we have, we feel um, we have more support for it. I am also very concerned about the training. That worries me a lot. I, I don't want our teachers trained. By salespeople? To, you know, when, to use money When we for come training. back to you, we'll have a different plan as far as the professional learning pieces okay. go. Okay, thank Great. Thank you. Well, we thank you. So we're going to pull that one. Okay. Thank you very much. PC 64. The thing is, if you want to wait on for two more quarters of data, then it's too late to, for them to purchase it, to have it That's in right. place for the beginning of the school year. The That's things fine with that me. are coming to us now are very timely and very important. And, this, and I don't know. It, there's a, there comes a time when we need to stay above the line. We need to be governing instead of micromanaging what our expert staff, this is their careers. Sandy, they're not just choosing. Sandy, there anything. are experts on the board also, and I very rarely pull but my they research. Had a committee. They had a committee, not I, just one. Uh, this is why I thought fine. it might be a good idea to have this be a um, separate conversation from bids and contracts. The, uh, yeah. the um, We have a difference of opinion on what my, the diff, micromanaging and okay. leading are. So do we have any other questions on bids and contracts? PC 64. 